All right, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, my first time in Mississippi. I don't know. That's I've been in Houston ten years, and I've never been to Mississippi. It's 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 a shame, but but here I am. Very happy to be here. Um, Charles invited me to give this talk a few months ago, um, after there was a decision by the Supreme uh, by the Supreme Court by the Fifth Circuit involving United Airlines and vaccine mandates, and you had three very conservative judges disagree with each other. The case was Sambrano versus United Airlines. On the one side, you had Judge Elrod and Judge Oldham writing that uh, uh, an injunction could be issued to bar uh, the firing of some employees when we get vaccinated. And then you had Judge Smith saying, this is really bad. The, the good ship Fifth Circuit's on fire. And I had this sort of like epiphany. I was like, wow, we have all these Supreme Court roundups. Why don't we do it in the Fifth Circuit where we call home? Or at least I call home. Uh, so that's the genesis of this talk. And I want to give you a lot of numbers and stuff. I can give you the spreadsheet later if you want. I want to walk through the state of the Fifth Circuit. And I should note we have a couple of Fifth Circuit judges in the room, maybe one more in the building floating around. Uh, but uh, we're, we're all friends here. So, of course, the Fifth Circuit, we are now. So, as I said, I have life tenure, they have life tenure, it's all good. Um, the Fifth Circuit is Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. I am in the third state in this uh, uh, in this lot. Um, the Fifth Circuit, of course, is based in New Orleans, and at present there are 17 judges in active service. For Judge Jolly's benefit, I will not be talking about the senior judges. They are they are excellent. They do a very good service. But we're focusing on the active judges. As you can tell, 17 is an odd number, so to get a majority, you need nine, as it were. And by the way, I had a, all these photos cropped. This is, this is a, a Josh Blackman production, uh, so that they look good. I had to make Duncan Ted a little bit bigger because he's, he's just so tall. Um, and unfortunately, Costa's head was just so big. It was just a headshot, so he looks like he's just, he's just a head. And I, I couldn't get a better photo of him, unfortunately. Uh, these are just the good photos. I like them, actually. I think everyone looks very distinguished. All right. Uh, so let's just break down who the active judges are. There are two remaining judges who are nominated by President Reagan, uh, both of them in Houston, both of them whose offices are on the same floor, a few feet away from each other. Uh, judge Jones uh, was appointed in 85, uh, and Judge uh, uh, Smith was appointed in 87. And just to give you a sense, <laughs> Judge Southwick knows the numbers, <laughs> Judge Smith was eligible for senior status, I'm uh, sorry, in 2011, and Judge Jones in 2014. Um, and they've been serving almost a decade more than they're eligible for under senior status, but they're still one of those productive members of the court in terms of uh, opinion output. There are two active Clinton nominees, at least for the time being. Just this morning, a nominee was put forward for Judge Dennis's seat. Uh, she's a magistrate judge in New Orleans. Uh, Davis? Douglas? Dana Douglas. Dana Douglas. Yeah, I just saw it on the plane this morning. Uh, so just this morning, President Biden nominated someone to fill the Dennis seat. Uh, he, he's doing this new fashionable thing where I take senior status upon the confirmation of my successor. I don't know how that's kosher. I, I, I'm very uh, – he's laughing. Yeah, I, I, I'm very – I know Judge Clement did this. A few others did this. I don't uh, – Stephen Breyer apparently did it. I don't know how that works. There's a vacancy and there's a vacancy. I'm not sure what you're confirmed to. Um, so I, I just have my caution, but this is what people do now. Um, actually, OLC put out an opinion saying this is okay, uh, but I don't think it works, right? Because at any point, a judge could say, yeah, never mind, I'm not taking senior status, and then there's no vacancy, right? With an executive branch position, the president could fire them and create the vacancy at will, but with a judicial position, I'm skeptical, but, but what do I know? I'm just a law professor. All right, so you have Judge Dennis, who's been in the Louisiana seat since 95, and Judge Stewart, who just finished his tenure as chief judge a couple years ago from Louisiana. Okay. We have four, <laughs> four nominees from President George W. Bush, uh, Judge Elrod, who is in Houston, uh, Judge, well, she was Judge Owen, now Judge Richmond, the chief judge. She's based in Texas, Judge Southwick right here in Mississippi, and Judge, ha yay, <laughs> and Judge Haynes also in Texas. Okay, and by the way, as you know, Judge Southwick wrote an excellent book on his nomination process. I, I mean that sincerely. He gave a talk on this. <laughs> If you want to read, if you want to read about the politics of judicial nominations, 
read his book. You will learn a lot. I enjoyed your talk in Houston a couple of years. So it's very, I learned a lot. I know this stuff. Okay. So there are four W nominees. We have. She will be the next chief after um, after Judge Richmond steps down or, or, or tenure completes. That's correct. And I think, is Oldham after him? Uh, I think Oldham might be next. Will it might be either either Ho or, or Ho would be next. Will it or Ho? I don't think might age out. No, I think I think it's either Will it or Ho. That that sounds right. Mm -hmm. I can do the math. Okay, there are three active Obama nominees at least for the present being. Again, Judge Costa. He actually has the <laughs> the end date. He announced a date certain, so I actually give him credit uh, credit. Uh, Costa did not say upon the confirmation of my successor. It's on a date certain. It's August of 2022. Uh, there's no nominee floating around for this floating head, as it were. Uh, he's in Houston. Um, Judge Graves, is he in Jackson? Does he keep yeah, his chance? Oh, well, well yeah, everyone's, everyone's right here in Jackson. And Judge Higginson is in New Orleans. Okay, now we get to the six active Trump judges, or the Trump nominees, as you might call them. Um, uh, we have Judge Willett, who's based in Austin. Judge Ho, who's in Dallas. Judge Duncan, I think it's in Shreveport. Uh, was it? Oh, Baton Rouge. Oh, ah, so close. That's so close. Baton Rouge, thank you for the correction. He's going to be mad at me after this one. Uh, Judge Inglehart, he's in New Orleans, right? Okay. And Judge Oldham is in Austin. And Judge Mississippi is uh, Judge, Mississippi, Judge Wilson sitting over there. Um, so these are the six active Trump nominees. Uh, three of them were put up pretty quickly. And then Engelhardt and Oldham came a little bit later. Um, and then Wilson was the last one because Mississippi politics is Mississippi politics, as it were. I'm, I'm just I'm in the room where it happened, right? Uh, a couple of years ago, the Texas lawyer did this cartoon, which I loved, of Oldham, uh, uh, Willett, and Ho is kind of like the three Texas judges from President Trump. I kind of like this cartoon. Okay, so th that's the current roster. Again, I'm not doing the senior judges. Um, as you can count with any math, there are five active Democratic appointed judges. Um, I won't be talking about them much more um, because in the present court, all the action is with the other 12 because the other 12 can more or less command a full en banc majority. They don't always have a majority, as we'll see in my, my numbers, but I will focus more on the 12 active Republican appointed judges. One point I'd like to convey is that this is not a monolithic court. These are not all people of the same mind. And I think that's actually a, a worthwhile contribution. Uh, I think it pushes back into this idea that judges are just these partisan robots. Frankly, it's not. My numbers, I think, will spell this out uh, with some some with some evidence. Um, moreover, uh, there's no one definition what a conservative is, right? I think there are different modes of being a conservative judge, and I think you will see that even on a given issue, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's habeas, whether it's free speech, uh, whether it's you know even federal juris uh, federal courts, conservative judges can veer left or right, even on textualism. They don't always agree. Um, this is the, the beautiful uh, John Minor Wisdom Federal En Banc Courthouse. Uh, it's so much nicer than the courthouse we have in Houston. It's kind of dumpy, but this is a beautiful courthouse. It's true. Um, the En Banc Court has 17 members, and that's what we focus on, at least at present. Uh, if the Costa seat goes empty, then we'll go down to 16, at least temporarily, or assuming they get the, uh, the Louisiana seat confirmed. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm focusing on about 50 cases. Um, from a period from March of 2018 through April of 22. Uh, why did I focus on this one? This was the period when the first two Trump nominees were confirmed, uh, Don Willard and, and Jim Ho, and then uh, Oldham and Duncan, the other ones, came a little bit later. And I picked April 22 because I think that was the last big on bond case. There might be some more coming out soon. I don't know. Um, but that was my period. So there are two categories of cases I'm looking at. First are on bond petitions. And the second are en banc cases, right? An en banc petition is where a party files petition for hearing, and it's not successful, <laughs> right? There's a poll, and it says uh, there was not a majority of judges to vote for en banc. The case is over. Go to the Supreme Court and complain about it there. Uh, sometimes a judge can sua sponte, call for an en banc poll. That's within the rules. That's permissible. But I focus on those where there's at least one noted dissent, right? Because if not even a single judge thinks the case is worthy of bonk, then it's really not worth counting. Um, the second category are those cases that are actually decided on the merits. That is, there's an en banc poll, en banc is granted, and then the full 16 or 17 member court considers the matter. 
right? And of course, you need a majority of nine on a 17 member court to carry a majority. Now, I put asterisks next to my numbers. Uh, this is not scientific. Um, I did the best research I could. I probably missed a couple here and there. And it's not my fault entirely. This is actually a criticism of, of, the, of the court. Uh, we often have the shadow docket, right? The Supreme Court's shadow docket. Guess what? Fifth Circuit's got a shadow docket also. There are a lot of orders that are not put in the website. They're only stored on the ECF, the electronic filing system. And they're not put in Westlaw. They're not in Lexis. So unless you know about it, there's no way of knowing it even exists, right? A lot of the en banc polls are never posted. Judges, listen, every en banc poll with a dissent should be put on a website. Uh, just make it public. There's no reason not to. If there's a 20-page noted dissent, it should not exist in the ether of this uh, pay, you know, the paywall uh, with the ECF. It's just very frustrating. So I don't know if my numbers are accurate. I, I, in fact, they probably aren't. I'm probably missing some en banc polls. Uh, so I'm telling you, my numbers are not perfect. But I'm off about 50. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try. Give or take. <laughs> then, then this is what I got. So take take it for what's worth for the value of your, your lovely lunch. I, I tried to as best as I could. I, I did. I there were a couple of cases that were really hard for me to find. And I, I I tracked because I like I I heard about them. I knew I knew was, I knew there was a dissent that sort of go through the electronic filing system. It's not it's not pleasant. Okay. Um, there are other cases that I don't count because they're so damn complicated. So Brakeen, there was the Indian Child Welfare Act case. It was, was it 300 something pages, Judge? It was 300 pages. I just don't count. I have no idea how to even line up the votes. Just, it, it was just insane. Uh, the other, the Collins versus Mnuchin case, that case was just a disaster, right? I, there, were, there were all these opinions. I agree with part 1A15. Not, you know, uh, so, again, this is not a scientific experiment, but I think it does give some broad sense of where judges are. Again, this is not meant for criticism, but, you know, <laughs> judges approach judging differently. Okay. The Federal Science Debating Society, if you didn't know this. Okay, so let's start with the en banc petition vote. So here's a, a graph, and, and the colors might be a little bit intimidating, but I'll explain them. Um, how often are judges voting to deny en banc versus to go en banc? And I think this speaks to sort of a broader trend of what the role of the en banc court is, right? I think most people agree that an en banc court should uh, preserve uniformity of circuit law. That if there are circuit opinions that sort of go one way versus the other, and there's some sort of ambiguity of what the circuit precedent is, I think everyone agrees that's a good use of circuit law. Uh, maybe there might have been an intervening Supreme Court decision, and that warrants overruling a circuit precedent, or at least clarifying a circuit precedent. I think everyone would say that might be a good use. Uh, but there are some judges who are more gung ho on en banc, and they think that en banc is a good way of error correcting. That is, if a circuit court panel reaches a decision uh, that, that is not correct for one reason or the other, the en banc process is a way to sort of remedy or correct that decision. Um, and again, I'm not making a judgment which is the correct approach, but even on, on our court, our court, the, the Fifth Circuit, God, oh, thank God I'm not there, right? Um, even on the Fifth Circuit, and these are all, by the way, the, the Republican appointed judges, there's a very different tolerance or preference for going en banc. Um, the judge, oh, where's my, my pointer? Uh, there we go. A little laser dealy. Okay, there we go. Um, even on the fifth, I can make statistics, right? Even on the Fifth Circuit, red means deny on bonk, green means grant on bonk, right? The judge most eager to grant on bonk is actually Judge Jerry Smith. He has something like, uh, where's Smith? Um, uh, uh, he would have granted on bonk in the most number of cases, like 60 something percent. Um, judge Jones is slightly behind him. Okay, Judge Willett is among the Trump judges the least willing to go on bonk, and Judge Ho is the most willing to go on bonk among the Trump among the Trump judges. Now there are different colored shadings which may not be visible, but these color shadings reflect something called a dissent from on bonk and a concurrence from denial of on bonk. These are often called dissentals and concurrals. The purpose of a dissentals for a judge to say we should have gone on bonk. <laughs> But we didn't, right? And here's why. And very often, dissentals are designed to flag to the U.S. Supreme Court, hey, there's something that went screwy here. Supreme Court, pick it up. So this sort of shade of green is judges who actually write dissents from denial of en banc. And Judge Ho has quite a number of them. Judge Ho has seven dissents from denial of en banc. Judge F uh, uh, Jones has five. Judge Smith has five. Uh, and the rest don't have any more than one or two. 
you occasionally have concurrences for the denial of en banc. That is, judges say, we did not go en banc, and that was a correct decision. The only person who's written them are Ho and Duncan. Ho has three, Duncan has one. Usually, it's if en banc sounds like, poof, <laughs> this one's over, right? But, but, but Jim and Kyle want to sort of explain why. Or more precisely, they often respond to the dissent. And there's actually one case to talk about later where Ho said go, I'm sorry, Ho said don't go on bonk, and then several other judges said let's go on bonk. So they kind of went back and forth. Okay? All right, this graph illustrates it a little bit more uh, easy to read. <laughs> uh, it looks like a Christmas tree, I guess. Um, but what I think this illustrates is the sort of preference for judges to go on bonk. Uh, Chief Judge uh, Richmond and Judge Haynes are the uh, least willing to go on bonk. Their their rates, I think, is 86 for Haynes and 75 for Richmond. Uh, our beloved Judge Southwick here is about 75 percent, just slightly below the Chief Judge. Um, and then you have the other judges, right? Uh, the judge most willing to go on bonk is actually Judge Smith. He has the most green. Judge Jones is not that far behind him. Uh, judge Ho is there as well. Duncan. I have to give Judge Wilson a bit of a pass because he's only been a judge for about a year and about two years, so his numbers aren't quite fully congealed. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's true. Uh, you know, I, I and I did this by the percentage of the cases you sat on, not just overall. So I so I adjusted it. Uh, but but these numbers reflect that some judges are more eager to go on bonk and others are not. Um, the on bonk court, you know, has five to ten cases a year. It sort of varies here and there. Okay. Uh, this metric I actually find useful. Um, about separate writings. Um, now, I clerked for a federal district court judge. I know you served as one, and others may have as well clerked. That's a lot more work, right? When you're in a federal district court, you have deadlines, you have trials, you have an evidentiary hearing, sentencing. It's a very busy job. When you're a circuit judge, it's a bit more leisurely. Sorry, it's true. Um, it's look, it's true. I, I look, I, I, I it's true. <laughs> You don't have as many urgent deadlines, and you have a lot of decisions, but they're sort of decided on your own time. Um, sure. Yeah, no, you do more more clerks as well, which is exactly backwards. You more district court clerks. I think that's absolutely true. I had two. My judge had two secretaries. I mean, bonkers, right? So we had all the cases, all the habeas, is all us. Um, but even if you're a circuit judge, some judges like to write more than others. So you have your usual assignment of opinions where you're assigned a majority. But then you can decide to write separately a concurrence or dissent, right? But those are in argued cases. This graph reflects separate writings for on bonk petition polls. That is a dissent from denial of rehearing on bonk or a concurrence regarding the denial of rehearing on bonk. And, and look, Judge Ho, he's, he writes in almost every darn case. Right, he has uh, of the of the thirty odd cases that had on bonk polls of the dissent. Jim wrote in three of them. I'm sorry, ten of them. So no, in one every three case, Ho's writing the on bonk court. Uh, 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 Jones and Smith are about five, and Elrod's just behind them at four. Um, the others, oh, sorry, Judge Wilson, but you know, you're you're <laughs> even Judge Judge Southwick had one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's wrong. No, well, it's it's okay, it's okay, but um. But, but these separate writings, I think, do give judges an opportunity to sort of express what they think the direction of the court ought to be. So even if you get en banc denied in this case, it might be a follow-up case later. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the en banc merit votes. This one's a little bit more complicated. These are the cases in which en banc review is actually granted. Okay, that is, you know, at least nine of the members in active service said, let's go hear this case. So this chart might be a little bit hard in the eyes, but I promise you I will walk through it. Um, so the green, again, is are you in the majority? The sort of yellowish oranges is are you maybe concurring with the majority? You didn't quite join the majority. And then the red is the dissent, right? Um, again, sorry, Judge Wilson, your column is much smaller, but that's, that's fair because you just weren't here for that long. Um, even though the votes on the decision to go on bonk are fairly split, that is, the conservative judge and the court don't agree on when to go on bonk, when the case actually does go on bonk, there's actually pretty broad agreement, right? So the, the most disagreement actually occurs at the poll, the poll phase, the petition phase, which I think reflects a kind of a judgment, should this case be uh, heard by the full court? And once they go, go full court, the judges are mostly in agreement, right? 
Um, now, I find it interesting. Who's actually writing majorities down on court, right? Um, do you publicize how you assign those? Is that, is that, is that behind the curtain? Curtain. OK, that's fine. I'm not allowed behind the curtain. I don't know how it's going to be. It's like we're in Oz. Well, anyway, I'll just presume uh, majority opinions are, appoint, are, are assigned by some process that we don't know about. Like Bruno, we don't talk about it, right? Um, so just who actually has written majority opinions in the en banc court, right? Um, Higginbotham's a lot of them, right? Which is fascinating because he's a senior judge. When he sits on a panel, he's very often writing the, uh, the en banc opinion. That's just, just my observation. But among the active judges, by my count, Jones had one, Smith had three, the chief judge, Richmond, had, had one, Jennifer Elrod had one, Southwick had one, Haynes had two, Willett had one, Jim Ho had two, or Kyle had nothing, nothing. Oldham had two, Wilson, TBD, right? Um, so that's sort of reflecting who's actually in the majority opinions, because writing a majority opinion, I, I guess, is not entirely easy, because you have to sort of accommodate the votes of eight or nine or ten of your colleagues. And what, what Jim Ho does is he writes concurrence to himself. He did that once or twice, where he write a, he'll write the majority on Bonk to concur to himself. So <laughs> I just think that's what we got with Jim. Um, who's writing concurrences, right? Um, Jones wrote two, Richmond wrote two, Elrod wrote four, Southwick had a concurrence, Haynes had a concurrence. Again, Jim had three, uh, Duncan had one, Oldham had four, right? So these are judges who I suppose agree with the majority opinion, but you know want to stake out some other other territory. Now the dissents. You know, I could add, please say right majority. Some of those concurrences made the majority, so the writer of what you call majority may not have had my votes. Correct. And, and actually, that's why I put an asterisk. My counts are not always good because it's not always clear a majority carries throughout the entire opinion. It might be part one, part two, but not part four. So again, this is very imprecise. But well, there was an introductory opinion almost to the Indian Child Welfare Act. That's right. Here's your roadmap. Yeah. I'm not really sure what we did either. But yeah. here's, <laughs> I agree. here's the majority on this issue. Here's the majority on that issue. And then you get to the opinion. No, I, I agree entirely. That's why I actually excluded the ICWA case from my tally. I didn't even count it. I excluded it altogether because I, I, I spent about 15 minutes looking at that syllabus, like going, what the heck is this? And I said, forget it. I can't. Um, good, good luck to the Supreme Court figuring that out. Um, and for writing dissents, and these are dissents that do not command a majority. They might be also partial dissents. I agree with this, but not this. Uh, Jones had three. Smith had two. Jennifer Elrod had two. Haynes had three. Willett had three. Ho had three, two, et cetera. All right. So... The, the en banc court's actually not terribly fractured. Um, this chart, what it shows, is how often a, a judge is in the majority en banc court. So the judge who's most in the majority en banc court is Sir Southwick. Oh, he go hard. Did he tie with me? Yeah. Yeah, he, he's had fewer cases. But he hasn't, take but, but you'll take it. You'll take it. <laughs> yeah, but 90% of the majority, he's in the uh, majority. But but even someone like Jim Ho's 85%. Right? So, the en banc court, I'm trying to get across you guys, is not as nearly as sort of divided, I think, at least, as the petition stage. The petition stage is where all the action's at. Uh, the least <laughs> uh, majority is Judge Edith Jones, who's only a majority 77%. She's also the most senior member of the court. The judges who are not listed on your last two charts. There are a lot of them. Which ones they miss? You have 12 there. I don't count. I'm only counting the Republican appointees. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, no, it's, it's not because it's not they don't matter, but but they, I, I'm trying to focus on the ones that actually can carry the court. But it would, it would be a much bigger graph, so I'd include the Democratic nominees. All right, this is a similar chart I showed you before. Who is running the most at the merit stage? That is, concurrences and dissents on the merit stage. And, and all of them, even though he's only been here you know, a fairly short time, uh, is far and away writing the most. He's had something like eight separate writings. So Poe is more willing to write on the petition stage, it seems, than on the merit stage. Which is, you know, something worth noting. And Jennifer Elrod is in third place with six. Uh, Josh Southwick had one separate writing. I think it was a concurrence. I can't remember. I have all the numbers in the spreadsheet. And Englehart and Wilson TBD. Okay. All right. So now I want to talk a little about ideology. Uh, you may have heard in the Supreme Court vernacular something called the Martin Quinn score. Have you heard of this? Where they sort of give a judge a number of how conservative, how liberal they are. And the way these scores are calculated is they take a justice, you know, like say Katanji Brown Jackson said, who are you most similar to? Are you more like Breyer or are you more like Ginsburg, right? Or maybe who, who you most resemble, more like Sotomayor 
right? And they, they basically map a new judge onto some old judge who we know what their ideology is. So I have something similar. <laughs> yeah. So I call it the EHJ score. <laughs> it's not perfect. It's not perfect. In fact, it's extremely inaccurate. But what I'm trying to see is, in my view, maybe I'm wrong, is that Judge Jones is the most conservative member of the court, and it's been that for about three decades. Um, how often are you voting with Judge Jones versus voting against Judge Jones? So <laughs> she's going to get a kick out of this one when she showed show this, right? I, I've, I've not shown her this, by the way. She's, she's going to maybe want to murder me after this. I, I'm, so, I'm so afraid of her. Um, <laughs> definitely afraid. Lord help me if you ever argue on the other side against her. Okay. Um, uh, so I counted all the cases, both at the petition stage and the merit stage. If you were on the same side of the case as Jones, you got a plus one. And if you're on the opposite side of Jones, you got a minus one. Okay, so again, if you're with Jones, I added a plus one, and negative Jones, minus one. So a perfect score is about a 51. That's, you know, that'd be a perfect score. Um, <laughs> so keeping up with the Joneses, right? Or E. Joneses, at least. Uh, at the poll score, the judge who's closest to Edith Jones is Judge Ho, and actually Olden's probably next. So, so really, on the, on the poll stage, Judge Jones is by, ha by far the most aggressive, right? Or at least close to the most aggressive poll stage. Uh, judges Southwick and Haynes, and Willett as well, are less likely to grant, uh, to go with Jones at the en banc stage, right? At the poll stage. That's why they're sort of below the, <laughs> below the margin. On the merit score, though, there's much closer spread. So you see even here, Southwick to Haynes is much closer. All right. So again, this is not scientific, but it's at least one way to measure ideology on the current Fifth Circuit. And it's, it's, it's <laughs> the next one, you get ready for this one. So the next thing I tried to do is actually add together, see these scores, right? So if Jones the perfect score of 51, Ho is next with a 39, right? I'm adding together the two Jones scores. And then you have Oldham at 23. So I plotted them um, to try to see. <laughs> there it is. I was waiting. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, I put an asterisk for Judge Wilson because he's only had a handful of uh, en banc cases. But um, this more or less, I think, illustrates the spectrum of the Fifth Circuit judges. Uh, from, I don't want to say most conservative to least conservative, but just the, the spectrum of conservative judges. Um, again, Judge O. Jones, she's in a, a world to herself. Um, <laughs> she, she, she's on her own pedestal. She's like the Corinthian and the door columns all the way up top. Uh, but, but Judge Ho, among the trunk appointees, I think comes close to voting with Jones <laughs> in the most cases. In a minute, I'll explain there was a big case where they disagreed. It actually went to the Supreme Court for next term. They just, in the, the Hewitt case, they just granted cert. Uh, Judge Duncan. Uh, is a distant third. He's almost the same as Judge uh, Oldham. And then Judge Smith, the people always say, oh, he's, a, you know, he's like an Edith Jones clerk, uh, a clone. They disagree on a significant number of cases. Uh, and among the W nominees, Judge Elrod is the closest. Um, Don's going to if I say this. Will it's the median judge in the Fifth Circuit? If you take this, if you take this numbering to, to, to heart, right, he's more or less the median judge. Uh, and any other court, Don Will would be probably the most conservative judge in the court. Like, if you just drop lifted Don Will in Boston, he'd be the most conservative judge in the First Circuit by, by a large margin. But on the Fifth Circuit, he's somewhere in the middle. Right? And, and I think that's actually a good thing. We have a very broad spectrum of conservative judges. Right? Will, in particular, on criminal justice issues, on, on habeas, on qualified immunity, he is not where the other judges are. And then the chief judge, you know, Will and the chief judge are pretty similar. They're not that dissimilar. You know, you might think they are. Engelhart's a little below. Again, I'm going to give Wilson a pass because he just started the job. Uh, Judge Haynes has a score of one, and Judge Southwick, you don't get a bar. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I want to make this point very clearly. The conservatives are not monolithic. They disagree. And I want to focus on three cases in which the conservatives vigorously disagree. So the first one is called, you remember this one? Hewitt versus Helix Energy. Solutions. Uh, this involves a very sexy issue involving the Fair Labor Standards Act, 
right? And I'm, I'm being facetious. Um, but you had a tool pusher <coughs> who was paid over time, right? And this guy was making was a two hundred thousand dollars a year, a substantial amount of money. And I don't want to get into the statute; it's kind of messy. But the question is, did someone who made such a substantial amount of money and supervised a number of workers on a on a, on a drilling station qualify to get this overtime pay, the you know time and a half rate under the FLSA? And look at this split. This might be a little bit hard for you to read, but the majority was Ho, Smith, Stewart, Haynes, Graves, Higginson, Costa, Willett, Duncan, Engelhardt, Oldman, Wilson. Right? That's not the lineup that you would think of. These are just you know partisan actors. They, they, this was this was a very collective lineup. Then in dissent you had you had Jones, the chief judge, Judge Wiener, Elrod, and Judge Southwick. Y'all get a ball. You get a ball. You get a plus one. <laughs> that, 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 you got a plus one. My point is, even in these sort of obscure textualist cases, what is a conservative isn't always entirely obvious, right? The, the judges disagree. Now, the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, grant a certiorari in this case will be argued next year. I have to admit, I find this case actually very difficult. I think I read the Jones opinion. I read the Ho opinion. You know, I, I, I think it can go either way, and I don't know which way the court will go. I mean, even the Supreme Court now. There's these textual decisions that are coming out almost every day. I can't keep track of them now. All right? So this is one case where the court's conservatives did not agree. All right, everyone rise to the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Uh, this was another case where the court's conservatives did not line up where you think they were. This is actually a fascinating case. It involved a teacher, Ar uh, Oliver against Arnold. It was a teacher who gave students an assignment to transcribe the Pledge of Allegiance. And listen to Born in the USA by Bruce Springsteen, right? It's our other national anthem, right? Uh, one of the students uh, refused to do the assignment. And then the teacher berated her and said, okay, you're going to get a zero on this assignment. And the question is whether this was a violation of the First Amendment. There was some qualified immunity issue, but it was a, it was a First Amendment issue at bottom. Right? The, the panel ruled, the three-judge panel ruled that the teacher can be assessed liability. And this went to the en banc court. And the court split 10 to 7. 10 to 7. Right? Denying we're hearing en banc is our good friend Jim Ho. And, and, and Jim basically said the First Amendment is significant here. Right? And you can't violate the First Amendment rights of the, of the students under cases like West Virginia against Barnett. And he was joined by Judge Willett and, and Judge Southwick and Haynes and, and Richmond. But then you had, was it four separate dissents from denial? I think Elrod wrote, wrote one, uh, Duncan wrote one, Oldham wrote one, I think Jones wrote one. There were three or four dissents from denial of all the court's other conservatives saying, how can we, <laughs> how can we hold a teacher liable for giving an assignment in class? Um, and this is a case, I think, where the court's conservatives disagree. One sort of favoring autonomy of school boards and you know uh, you know not not punishing teachers for giving assignments the other saying free speech compelled speech and of course this was a conservative teacher punishing a liberal student <clears throat> you know if the optics were reversed if you had a liberal teacher making some student recite the uh you know the 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 black lives matter chant or whatever else it is would the case come out differently so this case actually settled i believe so i don't think this will go upstairs uh but there's another case where the course conservative disagreed the last one, I'll start with where I began, uh, Sambrano versus United Airlines. And I flew here this morning United, so I think I have recusal issues, uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, this was a case um, involving a vaccine mandate. Uh, United Airlines, uh, this is even before the Biden mandate. The United Airlines, on their own you know, terms, uh, uh, require their employees to get the COVID shot. And a number of employers raised, uh, employees raised religious based objections under the free exercise clause and RIFRA, not a free exercise clause, kind of. And um, the airline said, no, we're not going to give you an exemption. Either you will have to get the shot or you have to go on based on an on a, on a unpaid leave status. I'm sort of oversimplifying the facts. Um, the airlines went to federal district court in Fort Worth. They didn't get Judge O'Connor, they got Judge Pittman. Uh, how it goes. Um, you know, and Judge Pittman denied an injunction. 
and he ruled that under prevailing law, uh, the remedy in employment actions is damages, right? You get damages later to make yourself whole. We will not give you an injunction to prevent you from putting on this sort of unpaid status. Uh, they went to the Fifth Circuit. Uh, this one was a barn burner. So they drew a panel of three of the most conservative judges in the country, right? You got Edith, uh, sorry, so you got Jennifer Elrod, Andy Oldham, and Jerry Smith. I mean, it's like a dream panel for a litigator, right? It's like, oh my God, thank you, right? You know, this is great. And they disagreed ferociously. I'll just read you some of the quotes from the opinion, right? So it's split two to one, right? Elrod and Oldham said, yeah, give an injunction. Their opinion was unpublished, as we'll find out, became very significant to the dissent. And their decision uh, was very narrow, and it, <laughs> it threaded a lot of needles to sort of get where I had to go. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on whether it was right or wrong. It's, it's not why I'm here. I'm not here to talk about Title VII. Um, let me just read you from the Smith dissent. He said, uh, notice how few of these facts appear in the majority opinion. That would get in the way of a good story. If I didn't know better, I might surmise that the majority didn't even read the plaintiff's brief. So once again, the majority junks our precedent to get the answer it wants. Once again, the majority snubs the Supreme Court to remake the law for these plaintiffs and their favored cause. I'll keep going. I'm oh, sorry. I could discern no reason for the majority's selective orderly, orderliness, but for every error pointing toward the result, my colleagues find most satisfying. This one. It's difficult to imagine what creative lawyers, not to mention federal judges spurred on by their zealous law clerks, I was one of those, will do with these new tools. The fact that an opinion is unpublished furnishes just another reason to vote to deny en banc scrutiny. But by today's ruling, the good ship Fifth Circuit is a fire. By the way, mixed metaphor. A ship is not a fire. Come on. I mean, a sh if a ship's on fire, the world will put it out. It's, just, it's a mixed metaphor. I don't like it. Right? You know, the, yeah, sorry. Sorry. It's a terrible metaphor. There's the good ship Fifth Circuit is a fire. The good ship lollipop. The lollipop, right? I, it's, it's a bad metaphor. Anyway. And then Smith says, we need all hands on deck. That's all. Right? Alleging ongoing coercion now supplies a private right, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Then he says, these are two well-intentioned but misguided judges. And he says, the majority has the most wholesome intentions, but they junk facts, text, history, and precedent. Then he ends, this is no personal criticism of my two conscientious co-panelists who serve with integrity, dedication, and skill. It's the main reason we have panels of three, allowing for honest differences on matters large and small. And I think there's still an en banc petition pending in this case. <laughs> so we have not heard the last of Sambrano versus United Airlines coming soon to a maybe a shadow docket opinion near you. <laughs> but I think this opinion, at least the Sambrano case, is a good place to sort of wrap up in that the Fifth Circuit has sort of these wide diverging views, right? They do. Um, but I like to think they respect each other. And I, I, I take Judge Smith's sort of comment to the end actually sincerely, right? He, he threw bomb after bomb after bomb. He said, but you know what? They're well-intentioned, right? Um, judges can in good faith disagree. I think they often do. Law professors disagree. They always disagree with me in particular. Uh, but, but I think this is even, even despite this sort of bombastic nature of the mixed metaphors of a ship on fire, right? The ship is sinking, right? That's the one. The ship is sinking, right? The Titanic, all hands on deck. That's on fire. Um, sorry, it's just been bothering me for months, right? <laughs> I, I, I used to write with very flowerly language. And I sort of clamped down because I'm like, okay, I'm an adult now, right? I'm going <laughs> to. Anyway. Go, go on YouTube and look at some of the uh, uh, film from the. Uh, uh, Battle of Midway, and then come back. With the, the ships are on fire. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, fine. But, but the ship is sinking, though. That is such a much it's such a better meta. Right, right. Sinking's better than fire. Go, okay. go look at those videos. All right. All right. I'll I'll do what I can. Okay. All right. That's all I got. Uh, I'm almost at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, Mississippi. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Any, any questions? Or? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, well, 
one. Yes, sir. Did you notice a difference in divergence between constitutional and statutory cases? I would think by the time you get on the Fifth Circuit, conservative constitutional yeah. is pretty much the definition of conservative, but statutes go all over the place. You know, not necessarily on Fourth and Fifth Amendment issues, criminal procedure, they split, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Judges Elrod and Willett have a bit more, um, a, a bit more votes in favor of criminal defendants, right? So that's Fourth Fifth Amendment. Uh, the First Amendment also they split. So the 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 the, the, the pledge of allegiance case I mentioned that they sort of frac fractured. Um, habeas also there are divisions, right, uh, uh, about sort of what kind of process is entailed for various defendants who maybe weren't afforded adequate counsel, right? Um, uh, even on statutory interpretation, I, I use the, the the Hewitt case as an example. They don't agree. And, and and one thing is, I am the textualist. No, I'm the textualist, right? You know, it's like the Spider-Man meme. Who's the real Spider-Man, right? Um, <laughs> that, does that go over your heads? Okay. You know, right? Uh, you know, they, <laughs> who has who has, who has the you know Justice Gorsuch and Lito, who is the pirate flag of textualism, right? Uh, so even even they disagree. So I. I I, I'll be honest, Judge. I went through, <laughs> not Judge. Uh, uh, I went through almost all the cases, and I couldn't really see a pattern. It, it was it was truly, I think, and I mean this is a compliment. Each judge sort of sees issues the way they see them, and they, that's how they vote. There's not like a there, there's not like a single monolithic ideology or, or jurisprudence. It really does vary, and so maybe we shouldn't be surprised when even the Supreme Court judges who came from the circuits vary so much. I mean, Gorsuch and Barrett keep dissenting on each other. I mean, it's it's, it's remarkable. Uh, anyway, uh, Dean. Do you sense that any of the senior judges have influence over the junior judges, or are there some team completely independent actors? Oh, I have no idea. That's a good question. I, I often wonder about actual influence, because, I mean, just keep in mind, Smith, Elrod, and, and uh, Jones, their chambers are basically adjacent to each other, on the same floor, in the same building. And, and, I mean, that has to have some effect when you walk by a person every day. Are you all in the same courthouse uh, in, in, in yeah, I mean, that, that, that has to have some effect, maybe not. I clerked for Judge Danny Boggs, who was in Louisville. And his nemesis was Boyce Martin, who was a Carter appointee. And their chambers were next door to each other. And this is, I'm not telling anything private. They did not speak. They were on no speaking terms for years. So I would, they would just sort of walk past each other, right? If there was court business, they would transact to it, right? You know, if those, we had basically the air conditioner replaced. So they had, you know, actually a court meeting, right? But, but actually they sort of don't. So I, I often wonder what effect one judge has on the other. Um, I don't, I don't know how much the senior judges have. I did notice that Higginbotham had an unusually high number of on bank opinions from the panels he was on. That's just, I, I, I just, even he's a senior judge, so maybe you give the senior judge the on bank opinions because there's any, any dog in the fight. I'm not sure. Other questions? Yes, sir. Was it your impression that, that many of the conservative judges voting in that case took issue with high income employee arguing that you can pay overtime? Is that consistent with the first spirit and purpose? Yeah. I, I, look, again, I don't think Judge Jones' opinion was, I, I, I think it had some really good points. I mean, the guy in this question is making more than 200 grand a year. You think of overtime as like an hourly work, you know, the hourly worker on the platform, right? So, um, you know, we often talk about, you know, is it a pro-corporate court? I don't know where the hell this court is in corporate stuff. They're all over the place, right? United's an airline, right? That's a corporation. You're issuing an injunction. It's an airline. I mean, this was actually why Judge Smith had a bean his bonnet. Can you imagine, like, a liberal district court judge issuing injunctions against racial discrimination, right? Like Carlton Reeves, right? I mean, what, what sorry, <laughs> what... What's going to happen if liberal district court judges are issuing preliminary injunctions against racial discrimination? It will turn Title VII upside down. So I get why Smith was so upset. But then you have religious liberty against a corporation. You know, so this entire is a pro-corporate court. I think doesn't do much work. It, 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 the votes are just again. I'll show you the darn graph. It's all over the place, right? I mean, it, nothing. Most of the cases are unanimous, right? Most, I probably know the numbers. What percentage of the panels are unanimous? Can be like 80, 90 percent, three zero. Yeah, I think I think nationwide for three judge panels, something like 80 to 90 percent are unanimous panels. Right, so it's only you know maybe 10 percent of the docket that are divided, and even 
more significant number actually make it to this stage, but you know, five or 10 cases a year. So really we're looking at just sort of like the, the margins, but that's where we sort of can differentiate where people are. Any other questions? All right, thank you all so much. I'm glad you came. Thank you.